Hello, thank you for joining us. My name is Brooke Alford. I am with the Central Chapter of the Indiana Native Plant Society, the outgoing president, and I also chair our DEIJ committee. Uh, the other hat I'm wearing this evening is I'm an urban ag and natural resource educator for Purdue Extension in Marion County, and they host these Zoom meetings for us. Um, I have not had the pleasure of meeting Nick, but I have heard a lot of growing interest in the hellbender. Um, a lot of people love that creature and also um, are becoming a lot more aware of the plight and the work that great folks like Nick are doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Nick. And after that, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to him. However, um, I will be watching the chat for questions. We'll do Q&A at the end. If there's any question that just needs clarification right away, I'll just gently interrupt Nick and we'll get a clarification at that time. So please just be entering your questions in the chat. And so tonight's speaker is Nick Bergmeier. Did I say your last name correctly? You did. A uh, research biologist and an extension wildlife specialist for the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at Purdue University. In Indiana, the eastern hellbender population has been reduced to only the Blue River in southern Indiana. However, several Ohio River tributaries seem to possess suitable hellbender habitat. So Nick evaluates the environmental conditions in these tributaries to determine if the habitat, water quality, and the um, food base would be suitable for hellbender repatriation. Expanding hellbender populations to additional suitable habitat will ensure Indiana's hellbenders are protected from stochastic events and will help restore these river systems to a more functional state. So Nick's work focuses on two separate facets of the Eastern Hellbender Conservation. First, Species, uh, species repatriation, and second, outreach and education. He also works with landowners to improve water quality. One of the main drivers of the hellbender decline has been poor water quality and sedimentation. So currently, Nick is developing presentations and programs to help encourage landowners in southern Indiana to adopt practices that will reduce water pollution. If successful, these programs should ultimately help to improve aquatic resources, including habitat for the hellbender. So Nick, thank you for the work that you're doing and thank you for being here tonight. Um, we have several people in the waiting room here waiting for us. I'm gonna let them in. If you would like to go ahead and share your screen, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thanks for having me. Let's see if I can get this to work twice. All right. Well, thanks for having me, everybody. Uh, I, I am Nick Bergmeier, and so I've, I've worked for Purdue University on this project since uh, 2015. So um, I've been here about it'll be nine years in June, uh, trying to trying to figure out what's going on with the Hellbenders and kind of help them out. Uh, and so tonight, I'm going to give you guys just a basically an overview of everything about our project, everything about hellbenders, their biology, and then some of the work we're doing, both the research and the actual conservation uh, to help hellbenders. So what is a hellbender? So a hellbender, it is North America's largest salamander. Uh, they can weigh up to five pounds, be up to 29 inches in length. They can live up to 30 years in the wild. In, in captivity, they can actually live. I think there's one that's about 45 or 46 years old. In Ohio, in captivity, that hellbender that I'm holding right there is the biggest one I've ever seen. And that's pulled out of the southern Indiana stream, uh, the South Fork of the Blue River. And that one is about right at about 24 inches long, and it was about three and a half pounds. So it was, it was a very big old animal. So before we move into the next, you know, to talk about hellbenders, most people always ask me, you know, where did they get their name? Uh, the story that we've always been told and that we always tell everybody else is that as uh, the settlers were moving through the country and they found hellbenders, uh, they thought they looked like something from hell that was bent on returning. So, so not the most endearing name origin, but they have a lot of other names. They call them old lasagna sides, which references the, the folds of skin along the sides of their body. They have uh, snot otter, which is because they're fully aquatic. They live in the water and they, they are super slimy. Uh, devil dog, 
mud puppy, which gets confusing because there's another species called a mud puppy, uh, mud devil, all sorts of names, but but we'll stick with uh, with hellbender for this. So hellbenders, they're super easy to identify if you actually ever see one. The adults, they have these big, wide, flat heads. They, they have these folds of skin along the sides of their body, which is uh, an adaptation to help them absorb oxygen. Uh, once they get about two years old, they don't have gills. And so they just absorb oxygen directly into their skin. And those folds of skin help increase that surface area. So this is especially important uh, for a fully aquatic uh, animal that since they just directly absorb oxygen, they re really require good water quality. Uh, they're super slimy. And by that, I mean, when you, when you agitate them, if you pick them up, if something tries to eat them, they literally start oozing slime. Uh, it's hard to hold on to. It's distasteful, so I'm told. Uh, and, and it helps them get away. They're also sexually monomorphic. You can't tell the males and the females apart except for a very brief period of time during the breeding season, uh, which, which is usually late August through early October. And the male's cloaca swells. Uh, but that's the only time you can tell them apart without, you know, an ultrasound or genetics. So these are just the, a few of these pictures are, are the different stages of hellbenders. On the, on the left, you have your larval hellbenders, which, which they actually do have gills, but they're very small. They're only about a, anywhere between an inch to maybe, maybe three or four inches. And those are the two left pictures. In the top right, you have the adult hellbender, which is Big flat head, folds of skin, uh, up to two feet long, or actually up to two and a half feet long if you if you get lucky. Uh, but the bottom right is what most people actually see when they see what they think is a hellbender, and that's the mud puppy, which is another fully aquatic salamander. But they have some main differences, which they don't have those folds of skin. Uh, they're not nearly as large, but they also have gills their entire lives. So they never lose those gills. They never absorb those back in their bodies. Uh, if, if you find a, a salamander in the, in the stream that's more than a couple inches long and it's got those gills, it's, it's definitely not a hellbender. So, you know, where do hellbenders live? Uh, they pretty much require cool, clear, uh, swift flowing water. Um, rivers and streams. They don't live in ponds or lakes. It's always, always clean rivers and streams with a nice gravel or cobble bottom and, and big, huge flat boulders. So the, the larvae, those little guys, they like to, they like to burrow. Pardon my dog, if you can hear that. Uh, they like to burrow into that gravel and cobble area. Uh, and that's where they hide. And the adults spend almost their entire lives under the big flat boulders. And, and they, once they pick a boulder, they don't tend to move very much. They'll move around a little bit for food. They'll move around a little bit to breed, but they really like to pick a boulder and stick with it. As far as food is concerned, the, the babies eat macroinvertebrates, so the little bugs that are on the bottom of the stream and, and worms. And this is actually important because much like the hellbenders themselves, uh, most of their food base, especially the baby's food base, is very sensitive to water quality. Whereas the adults, they'll eat, they mostly eat crayfish. They are considered a crayfish specialist. And then they also, they'll eat fish. They'll really eat just about anything that gets close to their mouths, but, but uh, crayfish seems to be the, the main prey. And this is what it looks like when a hellbender eats. So they usually just hang out there and then when something gets right next to it, they grab it and they, they have teeth, but they're very small. Um, and they, they usually just swallow things whole. So, so if, you know, they'll grab that crayfish, you'll see a little poof and, uh, that's him swallowing that. And that's a little bit of a problem because hellbenders, especially adults, will take fishing lures. They'll take fish bait, especially people fishing for catfish. And when they swallow that, they tend to swallow the hook. So the hook will end up in the throat. It'll end up in the stomach. It's not always just in the mouth. So usually if people catch these, we ask them just to cut the line because otherwise they end up tearing the throat or tearing the stomach, which is, which is uh, fatal for, for the hellbender. There isn't really much that eats hellbenders, uh, especially the adults. That otter in the top right photo, uh, that's one of the, one of the only things that'll eat an adult hellbender. And that is actually a hellbender that otter is eating. 
Uh, raccoons especially will eat the juveniles in shallow water. A really lucky mink. We have seen a mink attacking a hellbender before. And then when they're small, fish, crayfish, other hellbenders, just about anything will eat them. Uh, there are some old hellbender recipes and old cookbooks in case anybody's interested in trying those. You can't actually do that. They're an endangered species, but, but they did used to eat them. As far as the life cycle is concerned, hellbenders, uh, it's, it's very similar to fish. So a male will pick a big rock. The females will come to the male. The females will lay their eggs. The, the male will fertilize the eggs externally. The female takes off and the male takes care of the eggs. Uh, it takes the eggs about 30 to 60 days to hatch. Uh, and then they hatch into those little gilled larvae. Uh, and then those larvae will actually stay with the male up to another three, maybe four months before they disperse. And then it takes about two years for the larvae to lose those gills. And at that point, they're considered juveniles. And then another four to five years until they're full, uh, until they're reproductive adults. So it's really from... From larvae to adult, it's almost seven to eight years before they can actually reproduce. So they're very, they're a very slow growing species, which is again another issue with them in terms of their conservation. And we actually consider hellbenders, they are they are called an indicator of uh, an indicator species. They're that sort of canary in the coal mine when it comes to a high quality stream. So they really are one of the first animals that that start to disappear when your stream quality drops off. But, but the problem with hellbenders is that the adults are actually fairly tolerant. So you can find adults in some really degraded streams uh, that you wouldn't really think of as hellbender habitat. It's the, the eggs and the larvae that disappear and don't do well. So you might get these, what you end up is you get these populations that are, that are just full of old adults that they, they might be reproducing, but those eggs and larvae aren't surviving in the, in the poor quality streams. And, you know, those, the, the, basically the suite of practices that ends up in, in poor water quality, especially in the Midwest, you've got, you know, agricultural runoff, both in the form of sediment, especially, and pesticides, you know, alg algae blooms in the rivers from the fertilizers. Uh, eroding banks, dam construction, really that whole suite of, of sort of typical conservation issues that affects hellbender or that affects water quality is, is a problem for hellbenders. The sediment, especially, it fills in those spaces between the little rocks on the bottom of the stream. And then the larvae don't have anywhere to, they don't have anywhere to hide. And so they, the larvae end up, they can't survive. And that's when you get those old, um, old populations. And some recent research, uh, which, which came out of Virginia, and this is really sort of the, the first study that looked at, you know, what, what's the landscape like in these areas that have disappeared, where hellbenders have disappeared, uh, and where are they doing well? And what they looked at were, were it was the forest cover um, at three different levels. They looked at it on the, the left drawing there, which is just the forest cover right around what we would call a hellbender site, so maybe like a few hundred meters of stream. They looked at the middle, which was the riparian buffer, so the forested area along the stream and the entire watershed. And then they looked at that right image, which is the, uh, the forest cover in the entire watershed. Uh, and what they found in Virginia was that it didn't really matter how much forest was immediately next to the hellbender site or how much forest was actually in the watershed, it really only mattered how much forest was remaining in the, in the riparian buffer. And they looked at a, a 50 meter riparian buffer. And what they saw was that if the forest cover dropped below about 63%, for some reason at that threshold, the hellbenders just started disappearing. Uh, they stopped getting reproduction or they, they had reproduction they stopped getting successful recruitment so they would find eggs but for some reason those nests wouldn't survive or the larvae wouldn't survive and so that's sort of given us a as conservationists uh that's sort of given us a target so now we're looking at these riparian buffers and and trying to get as much forest and and native natural vegetation in these buffers to help protect to help protect these hellbender populations 
So this is a map of the historic range of hellbenders. So they really used to range all the way from Missouri up the Ohio River, all the way north into New York, and then down the Smoky Mountains into North Georgia, even North Alabama and Mississippi. But at this point, we really only have healthy hellbender populations and that small yellow spot in, in uh, Pennsylvania and then in the Smoky Mountains where or the Appalachian Mountains where you get farther away from, from uh, you know, human impacts. And these declines, they started way back in the, the early to mid-1900s, and, and they really, really took off in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s. They did attempt to list hellbenders uh, back in uh, the mid-teens, the mid uh, to, uh, but in 2019, they, they declared that they weren't, the eastern population was not, uh, was not suitable to be listed. And they did get sued, so they are currently reconsidering uh, listing hellbenders again. So we're we're sort of waiting on that decision. But the Midwest is is especially at risk because we are sort of the hotbed of agriculture. Um, and in Indiana, if you look at this map, you kind of see, you know, hellbenders go all the way up, partially up the Wabash, all the way up the Ohio. That is not the case anymore. And, and I'll talk about that here in a second. So back in 2007, the DNR, they decided they wanted to, they didn't want the hellbender to go extinct in India. They, they wanted to keep it around. So they contacted Purdue and they said, you know, hey, how can we, can you guys design a program to study the hellbender and see if we can figure out how to, how to protect it? what we have, and then more importantly, maybe how to restore what we have and maybe even expand. So that started in 2007. So what did we know at that point? Well, we knew where they occurred. And in Indiana, the only place they remained in 2007, and actually at this point about the same, is the Blue River down in Washington, Harrison, and Crawford County. So, so this is a really nice watershed. It, it's got a lot of forest. Um, it does have a lot of agriculture, especially in, up in Washington County, but it is probably the, it's not surprising that this is the last river they managed to hold out in. There was a single hellbender found a few years ago in Silver Creek over between uh, Floyd and Clark counties, which was very surprising to everyone, but it was a very old animal uh, that has probably been there for decades and, and no one thinks that Silver Creek at this point has a population of hellbenders. It's just one of those old animals that was sort of hanging on, waiting to, uh, to blip out at some point. We also knew in the Blue River that even though it was a, a healthy river, that the population had reached sort of a critical low. The DNR had been doing population surveys, and every year they kept going, just kind of creeping down to nothing, uh, which is not surprising because they had not seen a juvenile or a sub-adult hellbender since the early 80s. So there had been little to no reproduction uh, in the Blue River since, since sometime in probably the late 70s into the 80s. And then finally, the DNR knew what they wanted. Uh, they wanted to basically create a, a population that was diverse, uh, resilient, and, and redundant. So, so they didn't get back to the point of uh, having to do this all over again. And real quickly, uh, basically, all this means is, as far as the, the adaptively diverse, that just means that they want to make sure the animals are genetically and, and you know, morphologically diverse enough that, that they can adapt to any future changes, the, you know, climate change, things like that, uh, so, so they can handle the future. And to do that, we basically had to start looking elsewhere for hellbenders because we had gotten our population so low that we could not go to Indiana to collect hellbenders anymore or to collect hellbender eggs. So we've started working with Ohio and Kentucky. They've got a couple of good populations. So we collect, we collect nests from these states and then we bring them into Indiana. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but, but we're getting almost 100% of our stock from Kentucky and Ohio. The resiliency is basically just making sure that the population as a whole is, is able to survive like specific stressors or mortality events. So, so the current numbers are unsustainable. Um, 
but we wanted to make sure we get our population high enough that that uh, if you know for some reason there's a small die off, that's not a big deal. Versus right now, if we lost a handful of hellbenders, well, not right now, but a few years ago, if we lost a handful of hellbenders, that would be a significant portion of our population. And then finally, redundancy. And all this means is it's literally within the river, we have multiple established sites with hellbenders. So if, again, if there's an event that happens at a single site that kills the hellbenders, uh, we still have other sites to draw from. And on a bigger scale, we are also looking at creating redundancy outside of the Blue River. So if something happens to the Blue River, we have creek number one or creek number two that we can go to or creek number three. And these are all just these are all just goals to make sure that in 50 years, somebody doesn't have to go back in and say, oh, we need to protect the hellbender again. We need to have a big uh, breeding or captive rearing program again. We're trying to get this all done um, in one shot to make sure that these guys uh, survive. And so we developed this this long term. And when I say long term, I really do. I really do mean it. At this point, we're we're going into I think year 18 uh, approach to this, and it it sort of had four phases. We had this first phase, which was just information gathering, you know, health and genetics, population assessment. We had a second phase, which was more like a population modeling and and an outreach and education phase. We've got the third phase, which is restoration, which is what we're actively doing now, and then a fourth phase, which is this broad scale. Uh, habitat improvement and expansion phase. But before we talk about that, I, I like people to get sort of an image of what we're doing when we're actually out working with hellbenders. So I like to just talk a little bit about what we do when I say things like survey and radio telemetry. So there's really two main ways to look for hellbenders in the wild. You either flip giant rocks that they hide under, or you snorkel in the river and look under those giant rocks. So that top photo, uh, that was from my grad work uh, when I was a graduate student. And I basically just hired really huge guys to go out and flip really huge rocks. And then I would crawl under those rocks and feel for hellbenders. And that's, that's how we do population sub studies. Uh, the, the snorkeling is more for looking for eggs. When we're looking for the eggs to collect for captive rearing, uh, that's that's, you know, snorkeling and, and shining lights under those big rocks. And then we also do radio telemetry, which is basically where we put a transmitter inside of the animal and it gives off a, a radio signal. And we can pick that up on an antenna and we can follow those animals around and see how they survive, see where they live, uh, to see where they go once we release them. And these are just basically if you're doing the top left photo where you're snorkeling around looking for eggs, what you're looking for is that bottom left photo where the, the male is guarding its nest. So it's got its head in the hole and it's looking out trying to prevent anything from, from stealing its eggs. And that's what we're really looking for. And when we find the eggs, uh, we take a probe with a little hook on the end. Let me mute that. We take a probe with a little hook on the end and we stick it under the rock and we're we're trying to hook these eggs and these eggs are basically like a long strands of pearls and so once you manage to get a hook on them you you can pull the whole batch out and they can, uh, let me fast forward that and when you get the big batch which will be coming up here that probably has a couple hundred maybe 300 eggs in it. So a hellbender nest can have anywhere from usually a single female, it would be more around 250 to 300 eggs, but we have found nests that are as big as six or 700 eggs. And those, that's usually probably two or three females that bred with the same male. And you can see the little embryos swimming around in there. So that's a nice, that's a nice developing nest. And that's what we like to see when we collect them. And so to our phases, um, so the first phase, and I won't talk about this too much, uh, we just looked at, we looked at the population health, and basically what we found was we had so few hellbenders that, that we were not even close to what would be considered a healthy population. And basically, we surveyed for two years, and we found 88 hellbenders in, 
in a, an almost 70 mile stretch of stream, which is which might as well be nothing. And so what we settled on is that there's so few hellbenders left uh, that they're really just not coming together to breed in the Blue River. Because all the hellbenders we found, we did blood sampling, disease sampling, water quality, uh, reproductive health. Everything was good. Our hellbenders were healthy. They didn't have diseases. They weren't overly stressed. They, their sperm quality was good. Uh, the water quality was great. And so we, we really, they, they weren't inbreeding. So we really just, at this point, we had a population that was so small, it was just incapable of sustaining itself. And so that sort of moved us into phase two, which was the population modeling phase. And basically what came out of this was if we did nothing, hellbenders in Indiana would be extinct within about 25 years. But if we started releasing animals and we got at least a 25 to 30% survival of those, those juveniles, uh, we would reduce the probability of extinction for the next 50 years to near zero. So, so that's actually a pretty low bar, 25 to 30% survival. So we were confident we could hit it if we could find the animals to release. Which brings us to the fun phase, which is phase three. This is our, uh, this is our sort of uh, restoration phase. And so what we do is we head start animals. And so head starting is basically just taking animals from the wild, bringing them into captivity and, and rearing them to an age until they, they are hopefully prepared enough that they can survive in the wild. Now, one of the, and, and in Hellbender's case, we do this with eggs. So we don't collect wild animals. We actually go out and collect the eggs, bring them into the zoos, and, uh, and then rear them. Now, one of the problems with captive rearing is that those animals are basically just like pets. You know, that's, they're, they're often, they, they don't have natural stimuli. They live in pretty sterile conditions. So they're really not prepared for the wild. And before I talk about that, I wanted to show you guys the video. This is how we raise the eggs. So in the wild, a hellbender male would, would be laying between these eggs or lying between these eggs. And he would, he would spin around and he would aerate the eggs. Uh, we don't have a male in captivity, so we build these these aeration systems that that bubble the eggs up and and make sure they stay aerated. It keeps the embryos from from uh, uh, connecting to the or from adhering to the uh, egg membranes, and it it just keeps them nice and healthy. But so uh, head starting, so we wanted to make sure that these animals are as prepared for the wild as possible. So at Purdue, we have our own rearing facility. And we basically rear these animals in as naturalistic as conditions as we can get. So we have these big streams that are almost 30 feet long with gravel cobble bottoms. They have rocks in the stream. There is a flow in, this, in these streams that actually matches the flow of the Blue River. So these animals are constantly inundated with flow they get used to those natural conditions. Uh, I won't talk about some of this stuff, but we also have reared some of these exposed to predators. So in this case, bass, uh, we've exposed them to actual Blue River water to see if that affects their the, the biota that grow on their skin, to see if that maybe makes them more immune to disease. But the one I, I really want to talk about is this, is this rearing them in flow. So that was the first idea we came up with. And basically what we did was we took some of our hellbenders and we reared them in aquaria and the others or in stagnant water, essentially. And the others we reared in, in the natural flow condition. And then in the lab, we exposed them to, uh, we put them in a big fake stream with a higher flow uh, that was higher than that is sort of the normal flow. So maybe like a, a low flood event. And we tested to see how well they could actually move upstream. And what we found was that uh, the animals that were raised in the flow, they they needed fewer attempts to get upstream. They didn't need as much motivation. They swam upstream faster, and and they were generally just more well adapted to, which is not surprising, that's what we expected. But they were generally just more well adapted to swimming in a stream than the ones that were were raised in, in uh, the way everybody else does it, which is in 
relatively stagnant water. So this gave us, at least in the lab, uh, an idea of how we should be raising our hellbenders. So we took those hellbenders, both the ones that were reared in the, the no flow conditions and the ones that were reared in the flow conditions, and we started really, and we released them with transmitters inside of them. And I'll talk about how that turned out in a second. But basically, our releases, uh, we do something called a soft release. So we take animals, all of our animals, and we put a big metal cage in the river and we fill it full of, of small boulders, uh, limestone riprap. They're about six inches, about six inches in diameter. And then we put a big mesh cage over top of the metal cage and we release our hellbenders into that. And that's what you see in the bottom right photo here is the metal cage inside of the mesh cage. And what this does is this allows the animals, it gives them about three days to just hang out in the rocks, in the, in the metal cage. They can't get out of the mesh cage. And uh, then after three days, we take that big mesh cage off and they can come and go from the, from the cobble and that metal cage as they please. And that, that really helps them de-stress. And we've seen that that actually helps them. They're less likely to move away from the site if they're released like this. We, we actually tested this against just releasing them and in a different kind of cage. Uh, and what we saw was they take off if, if you do it like that. But if you give them these nice cobble beds, which is what we call them to, to uh, relax in, they, they stay put and then they stick around where you want them to stay, which is exactly how we want them to do it. So at this point, we've actually been doing releases for since 2017. We released our uh, 514th animal in 2023. So we actually passed 500 animals and most of our animals, when we release them, are, are somewhere between three and a half and five and a half years old, depending on, depending on uh, you know, what kind of work we're doing with them in the lab. We do do a lot of experiments, uh, not like mad scientists-like experiments, but, but mostly these conditioning type of experiments to see if we can improve their survival. Uh, this is what our releases look like. So I talked about that big mesh cage. That's what you see on the left there, somebody releasing a hellbender into the mesh cage. We usually like to have local landowners, a lot of our partners, the zoos and the DNR and, and various other partners come out and experience these releases, it, it, especially with the landowners. It gives them a sort of connection to the project so they can see what we're doing and, and they, they really develop more of an appreciation for it than just, you know, somebody knocking on their door and asking them if they can walk through their land. This is a lot of the work that we do. So the animals that we track we track them year round so it doesn't matter if it's if it's uh you know the middle of winter and snowing or it's flooding in the spring we we follow them around to see how they behave in these in these different environments and what we found with those animals that were raised in the flow is uh that they do remarkably better than than the other animals so we did a little experiment where we released some animals in the fall and some in the summer, and they were split between the, the group that were raised in the flow and the group that weren't. And the animals that were released in the summer with the flow, they almost had, they had actually about 75% survival through a full year. This graph shows 100% survival. That was through 265 days. But through a full year, that survival stopped at about 75%, which matches wild adults. So that's good. Um, and the other groups, the fall animals and the summer animals that weren't raised in the flow, they dropped below 50%. So they, they had fairly low survival. But if you remember back to that earlier graph, we only need 25 to 30% survival. So, so getting 75% survival is, is great. Uh, we do have some things that like to mess with our survival numbers. So sometimes the, the animals we release do weird things. That animal on the top left decided to hang out in a pole in a mud bank right at water level, which is not normal hellbender behavior. Uh, and the day after we found him in that mud bank, we found him in the belly of that water snake. Uh, that's a raccoon in the bottom photo. I set up a camera next to one of our, our nice cobble beds and, and the raccoons like to hang out right next to them and wait for the hellbenders to get close to the shore, which 
which the animals that we released in the summer that were conditioned to the flow don't move to the shore, but all the other animals do for some reason. And the raccoon took advantage of that. Uh, it's very hard to see, but our cage is in the oval on the left and on the circle on the right in the inset photo, that's actually a river otter and he, or it, um, really hung around that cage for a long time trying to see what was going on in there. And I was sitting there and eventually he, I think, noticed me and moved off. But but we have to we have to pay attention and watch these cages to make sure wild animals and uh, wild people don't mess with them. So one thing that's that's really important that I talk about is that this is not just a Purdue and a DNR project. We have a ton of partners. Uh, I mentioned Kentucky and Ohio. We really wouldn't have a project at this point if it wasn't for Kentucky and Ohio. So we have them to thank for for all of our remaining hellbenders, plus. The zoo, all the zoos around Indiana, Indianapolis Zoo, Fort Wayne Children's Zoo, Mesker Park Zoo in Evansville, and Columbian Park Zoo, they all raise hellbender spores in addition to the ones we raise at Purdue. So this is this is a big effort, um, and it's definitely not just Purdue and, and the DNR going out and doing this work. So one thing a lot of people ask is, you know, how would you consider, when do you decide that this is successful? Um, and what we've sort of settled on is that it will be considered successful if we see two to three years of actual recruitment. Uh, so that is not just finding eggs, but actually finding larvae in the wild uh, at, our, at our primary release sites. We have one site where we really release a lot of animals at, and then at least another year or two of recruitment at one of the other sites. So we actually have a pretty broad range of sites at this point. We have 12 or 13 sites that we're, we're actively working in. And so we need that two to three years at, at the main site and then another one or two at, at one of these other sites to, uh, to really consider this as a sort of a success. And I am extremely happy to report that last year, for the first time, we, we found a, a little baby hellbender. And so this was the first larval hellbender that's been ever been reported in Indiana, and it's the first sub-adult hellbender that's been seen since the 80s. So, so it's been, you know, 40 years since anybody's seen something that wasn't an adult hellbender in Indiana. So this was super exciting, uh, and, and this was actually, this was the first time we had really gone out and put effort into looking for, for the larvae, and we were, we were thrilled that we found one on our first shot. So we're gonna continue these surveys and hopefully have, have more luck. And that brings us to our final phase, which is this, this large scale habitat improvements and our population expansion. And basically for the population expansion, I have been traveling through all the straight, the sort of Ohio River tributary streams in Southern Indiana, and evaluating them for hellbender habitat, seeing if they have the big rocks and the gravel cowl bottom. Uh, and unfortunately, almost all the streams I've evaluated have been have been pretty unsuitable at this point for release. Either they just don't have habitat, or they're so degraded with with sedimentation that that they're probably not good hellbender sites. So at this point, we've sort of settled on Indian Creek, which is also in Harrison County, as a potential release site and then Lawfrey Creek, which is all the way in Southeast Indiana, pretty close to Ohio. And then maybe uh, 14 Mile Creek, it says no up here, but I didn't get to evaluate a large chunk of the creek because of some landowner issues and, and there's a dam on the creek, which, which we didn't wanna mess with. So if that dam ever comes out, we'll probably go back there. And that was actually one of the last sites where they saw hellbenders. So, so hopefully someday that might be available and we'll have a handful of creeks, at least in Indiana, we can, uh, we can look into as potential, as potential habitat outside of uh, the Blue River. And then as far as the landscape scale conservation, we received a $2.7 million grant last year to provide cost share to local farmers. So, uh, you know, Washington and Harrison counties especially have large farming communities and you know, we ask, we, we can ask people to, hey, can you do these conservation practices? But, but that's, you know, that costs them money. And so we thought 
the best way to get this done is if we go out and get some money ourselves so that we can actually provide the, provide them some assistance to uh, to do this work. And we're not just saying, hey, do this work for us. Uh, so basically, the objectives of this this program is to do things that benefit both water quality and farmers, which is basically soil health and soil retention and, and decreasing this, which eventually decreases the sedimentation into the rivers and, and improves that aquatic resource. So, so that's really what we're focused on. Um, right now, for this first go around, we're focused on the four county Blue River watershed. Uh, we'll probably, in, an, in a, a renewal, which will come up in a couple of years, try to expand this a little bit, maybe over into Clark County, which would capture that 14 mile creek. Uh, and we'll we'll change a few things, but this is our focal area right now. I'm not gonna go over this, but basically what these practices are, are the things that you can think of that would, that would be good for farmers. Uh, you know, uh, cover crops, um, riparian buffers, grass waterways, filter strips, fencing to keep cattle out of the stream, basically anything we can do that benefits both farmers and, and uh, water resources, that's what we're, that's what we're targeting. Uh, we managed to give out about $600,000 last year, and I just talked to the person that actually manages this project, and she said we have already have a lot of applications this year, including some riparian uh, some riparian buffers on the Blue River, which is exciting because that's not always the most that's not always the most attractive practices to farmers. Uh, but we we look like we should be able to to fully fund farmers this year that are interested in the area. So so this is all great news, and uh, we really hope to expand this program. Right now it's two point seven million. Uh, the next go around, we'd really like to get some more partners and and really expand that pot of money so we can we can get even more conservation on the ground. And they and they want it in this area. Uh, one of the things that prompted us to do this was we talked to the local uh, NRCS and they said they have so many unfunded applications because they just, one, can't get to them and two, they just don't have have all the, uh, the funding. So this will really help fill in some of that gap. And then finally, I'm coming up to the end of my time, but I usually talk a little bit about, people usually ask me, you know, how they can help. And it's really similar to what we do for farmers, just usually on a smaller scale. Anything that reduces runoff, you know, it reduces pesticide use. If you happen to be, you know, in a stream that you know has hellbenders, we recommend not moving the rocks. This isn't a huge problem in Indiana, but in in the southeast where where you get a lot of you get a lot of recreation in these streams and it's amazing how many rocks you'll see just moved out of the stream and stacked on the riverbank. I mean, there'll just be piles and piles of rocks just because I guess people like to stack rocks. Um, but that's especially a problem for hellbenders because they live under the rocks and people tend to, uh, sometimes they drop the rocks on the hellbenders or it's just reducing the habitat for the, especially for the adults when you move the bigger rocks. So just a few of the practices we promote, you know, riparian buffers. Uh, if you live in, even if you live in sort of an urban area, if you live next to a stream, just leaving a few strips of unmown grass, uh, you know, that's, that helps filter any sort of runoff and slow down the water that's getting into the stream. We really heavily promote rain gardens and uh, to, help, to help absorb some of that water and reduce, just overall reduce the stormwater runoff. And then of course, especially with aquatic amphibians, reducing pesticide use, because um, basically anything that gets in the water, they're going to absorb it. So, so minimize pesticide use as, as best you can, especially, you know, if you're, if you're going to use pesticide, be careful around streams and, and don't be one of those people that decides that more is better. If, if you can just use the minimum amount, please use the minimum amount, you know, reduce fertilizers, which really helps lead into native plants because, you know, native plants frequently don't need a lot of fertilizers. Um, and, uh, or, or pesticide really. So, so we do try to promote native plants where possible. That's, these are actually pictures of my native plant garden in my backyard. So I, I felt like this was the appropriate place to, uh, finally show off my native plant garden. And finally, uh, we have, we have two websites. So we have the help, the hellbender website, which we are currently actually renovating. So, so it's uh, gonna probably go through some, some glitches here here momentarily, but the Help the Hellbender website has 
all sorts of information about Hellbenders and our program and all of our partners' programs. And then the through Purdue Extension, their Purdue Rainscaping Education Program is a great program for for learning, you know, the the technical side of rain gardens and rain barrels and and various other rainscaping uh, issues. And with that, I've just got a lot of people, you know, I need to thank O'Bannon Woods State Park and Harrison Crawford State Forest are sort of local properties that are super helpful. Uh, Kentucky Division Fish and Wildlife Resources, ODN, Ohio DNR, uh, Nature Conservancy, all the zoos, IDEM, and, uh, and a lot of other partners that, that help out here. So with that, uh, I can take any questions that you guys might have. Thank you so much, Nick. We have um, several great questions in the chat here. And by the way, um, I will be teaching the rainscaping program in Marion County June 13th and 14th, I believe. So Excellent. if you're interested, please reach out. Excellent. I didn't even know I was giving you a plug. <laughs> Why, thank you. Well done. <clears throat> I will be sure to be publicizing that well, and you can always um, email me personally. I'll put my email in the link here in the chat here. But let's dig into these questions. Tom asks, so um, back to the fishing hook. Um, will the fishing hook dissolve in the stomach if the line is cut? Well, I can't say for sure. Uh, I mean, probably they do have pretty strong stomachs. Um, I mean, they do dissolve things like crawfish uh, exoskeletons. But the alternative is ripping it out of the stomach. So we generally just we generally just suggest to leave it. It probably depends on the type of hook you have, whether how quickly it will dissolve, but but uh, more people tend to hurt the animal than than not. So we just promote cutting it. Okay, thank you. Um, then uh, Tristan asks, is the historic range based on historical observations such as old journals, et cetera, or is there another form of evidence that has identified or defined that territory? So hellbenders are pretty well surveyed. Um, most of the historic range is based on old, old journal articles and old biologist um, notes where they used to find them. Um, so with this historic range, um, since they are pretty limited to rivers, um, I mean, well, they are limited to rivers, uh, they these are all pretty much based on old old records um and they were well studied with by a handful of biologists throughout the 20th century and then they really got they really got studied uh once about the 2000s rolled around uh and people started realizing like oh these things used to be everywhere and now they're nowhere uh they really became a popular species of study and so just about every state has bio dedicated biologists that are out there looking in all of these historic areas and not finding them anymore. And they do do some, so you do the rock flipping like I talked about earlier. They also do a lot of eDNA, which is environmental DNA. So they actually can go out and take water samples and see if you can detect the DNA in the water. Um, and so we have a pretty good feel for where they are and where they aren't at this point. But yeah, these historic, these historic records are mostly based on uh, museum records and, and old journals. Okay, thank you. Linda asked, do the young disperse or stay in the adult male's territory? So for the first few months, they stay almost, they usually stay pretty close to the male, maybe even within the rock. And then they, they disperse. They don't tend to disperse super far, but the caveat is we don't, actually know a ton about the larvae because they're they're one they're hard to find and two they they're too small for us to do anything with really so we can't put transmitters on them some people put very small they're called visual implant elastomer which is basically just like a little neon injection that you can put in like the armpit and so if you if you shine it if you catch one and you you put a, a fluorescent light over it, you can actually, it'll glow. So it'll glow whatever color uh, you you uh, implanted. And so that can help you follow them around if you can find them, but they're just not very well studied. So we, we think they don't move far, but we don't really know. All right. 
Okay, Tristan has another question. Have you observed or have concerns about estrogenic pesticides or other chemical pollutants? Yes, we do. So one of the things we did, um, that bottom one there, which is the vetilogenin screening. So that is a protein that should only be present in females. Uh, and so we tested, it's, it's, it's related to egg production. And so we tested all of our animals that we captured during this study to see if maybe the males were, were, were producing this, this protein. And we found it in none of the males. Um, so, so we found it in all the females and none of the males. So we're at least, at least based on this particular uh, marker, it does not appear to be a problem. Good, great, thank you. Another question from Tristan. Are you discussing no-till practices? I think you did mention that. It depends a lot on crop type, but some of the seed planters have been shown to produce equal or better production. Um, yeah, so no-till no -till is definitely in that list of practices that we, uh, we work with. Um, and I'm not gonna pretend that I'm the guy who actually works with, with all the farmers on these things. We, we hired somebody that is much more knowledgeable about farming and, uh, and uh, these various conservation practices. But uh, yes, no-till is one of, the, uh, one of the options. And NRCS does a lot of work with growers around no-till, correct? Oh yeah, yeah. So the NRCS and the local local soil and water conservation districts in these couple of counties are excellent, and uh, they've managed to really get even before this project. They've got a lot of buy-in from from landowners to do to use conservation practices, and I think Washington County is actually at least at one point recently was the number one adopter for for uh, cover crops, and um, so they've done a great job. And I mean they. Basically, me and my boss got the money, and then we hired somebody to work with the, the farmers. So we, you know, it's it's hard to send a biologist out to work with farmers, and there's sometimes a disconnect there, and we don't know what we're talking about. And we hired somebody that knows what they're talking about. <laughs> that makes sense, and I think that with farmers, once they see other farmers and people they trust um, incorporating these new practices, they might be a little more willing to do it themselves. Right. So we have we have several farmers that uh, are pretty interested in hellbenders and they've they've done a good job of talking to other people. And and it looks like that is the scenario that's playing out. Yeah, great. Great. So Lauren asks, how would I get directly involved? Um, well, it's a little hard to get directly involved. Um, partially because this is an endangered species. So there are some hurdles to being directly involved. Uh, some of the zoos, I don't know where, where you live. Some of the zoos have volunteer programs that, that might allow to, I mean, I know Indy Zoo at least one point had a volunteer program that helped let people come down and work with us a little bit. And um, if you're close to Purdue, there's possibility to help actually take care of the baby hellbenders that we have up there, or the, the juvenile hellbenders. Uh, it's a little difficult to get directly involved with the work I do because I work all over the place and work kind of a kind of an erratic schedule. Sometimes I'm in Kentucky, sometimes I'm in Ohio, sometimes I'm in North Carolina, so I never really know where I'm going to be. Um, and right now I'm just staring at a computer, so so it's it can happen. Um, if you wanted to contact me, we might be able to work something out depending on the kind of work we're doing. That's probably the best way. And Lauren, I would say also just, you know, tell all your people, all your friends and your family what you're learning. <clears throat> there will be a, um, a YouTube video. We will have a link on our YouTube channel to this presentation. So share it widely and share it often. And I don't know what county you're in, but um, contact your local extension office and ask them when they're gonna be offering rainscaping. Uh, Michael, um, Mike Moya, the streams in the Missouri Ozarks are still in good shape, but the hellbenders have still declined. Some think it is due to stocking of the streams with non-native trout. Any thoughts about that? Uh, well, we do know that Hellbenders don't particularly like trout. Um, 
the Missouri situation is a little bit strange because you're right. The streams are, they do seem to be healthy. Um, we don't know if, so with this research I just talked about that came out of Virginia with the forest cover and the, and the riparian buffer, I don't know where some of those streams fall out in that, uh, in that percentage in their buffers. Because even some of the streams that in Virginia, Virginia that look nice, like the water quality is good, uh, when they drop below that forest cover, something happens that is causing the hellbenders to disappear. Even though they did a lot of water quality and it didn't seem to be something that they were detecting. So, so there's something sort of uh, cryptic that goes on at least in Virginia, that when it, it drops below that th that forested threshold that is causing these declines, um, and we just don't know what it is yet. And so I don't know about Missouri, but no, the trout are definitely not helping. Um, or I will, there's not a, there's not a lot of studies out there that are, that explicitly point to the trout, but that's certainly an extra added stressor that, uh, you know, I don't want trout in our streams. <laughs> That, that I'm working in, I don't think that would be a good thing, and I suspect it's not a good thing. So, Nick, when you when you talk about um, when you talk about the forested riparian buffers, how much reception is there to um, to reforesting that riparian? And by riparian, we mean that adjacent shoreline and whatever. What was the depth of the buffer that the hellbender needs? Fifty meters. So meters. You know, 180 feet or so. What, um, how much success or how much interest have you seen in reforesting that riparian area in a lot of our streams? Uh, not a ton. So one of the problems with riparian buffers is the way the program is set up through NRCS is it, it just, and I don't, I don't know all the details, but it doesn't offer as good a return for the landowner as they cover crops or some of the other conservation practices. So they're immediately less attracted to it uh, for economic reasons. And then also it takes, you know, a riparian buffer pretty much takes land out of production permanently. Like nobody's, in, most people aren't installing riparian buffers for a few years and then, and then taking them out. Um, so that is something that we are working on, especially for the next round of uh, the next, the renewal for this program is is finding a way to to get a much better economic return uh, for these riparian buffers to make them more attractive for landowners. Because if we're going to ask them to take their land out of production, presumably permanently, uh, we want to make sure that that's as attractive an offer as possible. So we're looking into into some strategies for for doing that with some new partners, and and uh, so we're working on that. We were pretty happy that we did a little bit of outreach between last year and this year's application period, and, and we did immediately get a landowner that came in with wanting to put in some riparian buffers. So I don't know if that's coincidence or if that's the outreach we did, but, but uh, it was nice to see. Yeah, that's great to hear. Thank you, Nick. Uh, one more question from Tristan. What was the journal article for that Virginia study? You know, I actually think I might have it open on my computer right now. <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And I will put a link to it in the chat. Um, yeah, I'll put a link to it in the chat here in a second. Great, thank you. Um, so Lauren says, thank you. I'm actually from Michigan, but I love salamanders and I'm looking for summer work and internships for better experience. Linda says, thank you for your excellent presentation and answering my question. I have a dirt basement with a sump pump. I have had tiger salamanders spend the winter down there. They came in along the water line to the pressure tank. I named them Sally and Mander. We have temps from minus 40 Celsius to plus 40 Celsius here in the semi-desert area of southeast Alberta. Salamanders are amazing. Well, that's always good to hear. Yeah. I just clicked Thanks. the link to that article. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Okay, we're a minute over, but um, this has been 
Absolutely fascinating and a wealth of information, Nick. Um, yeah, we'll probably ask you to come back at some point. I will be happy to come back. Okay. All righty. I think that's all for the questions tonight. Everybody, thank you for joining us. And um, again, we will have this up on our YouTube channel as soon as possible. And please share with all of your friends and family. You all have a good night. And Nick, I believe we will reach out to you here soon also um, to talk about a donation. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. I really don't ask for anything when I do these. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we normally, um, if people are not accepting stipends, we like to donate to the organization of your choice. So, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, we, we have, I have to see if the link is still there since we're renovating the website, but we have a direct link to basically an account that we can we normally use we mostly use it for outreach and education stuff okay. um that'd be perfect and, uh, sometimes it goes towards various studies but usually we it's it's kind of our extra fund that we use for mostly outreach and education okay perfect we'll be reaching out to um get that contact information okay excellent thanks well, thank again you. for your time that was great nick really yeah. Really liked it. Oh, good. Thanks. Hopefully, uh, if I come back, I'll have more good news as far as uh, finding more little babies. Yeah, we're hoping so. Definitely. All right. Take care, and we'll see you next time. Sure. Thanks. Bye.